fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. He's written a book and uh, he kind of covers uh, unusual uh, medical. Uh, uh, Thomas Morris and... and, and um, his his book was the uh, mystery of exploding teeth, I believe. That we'll get it. Thomas, um, how are you doing? Hi. Yeah, very well, thank you. Yeah. So, um, wow. Uh, so what brought you to write this kind of a book? Well, I remember the moment I thought of the idea uh, very clearly. Um, about three years ago, I was writing um, a previous book, which is um, a history of heart surgery. And in the early stages of research for that, I was sitting in a library, um, and I spent a lot of time looking through old journals, uh, medical journals, looking at how people used to treat heart disease in the age before surgery was possible. And... Um, I was, um, I was, I remember I was reading this article from a, a journal published in the 1820s, and you know when you, your eye catches something, you, see, you spot something that's much more interesting than what you're meant to be reading. Um, and my eye strayed to the, the next page of this journal, um, uh, and I found this extraordinary article um, with a headline which was, Sudden Protrusion of the Whole of the Intestines into the Scrotum. And oh. this oh, is... Wow. <laughs> This was an article published in, in 1829, and uh, what had happened was um, a labourer in Bristol, uh, in the west of England, had been run over by a cart laden with bricks, and he had this this horrible injury. Um, and I was sort of fascinated because it was it was kind of disgusting and and and, and funny, and I mean obviously not funny for the poor guy who'd, who'd undergone this. Um, but I sort of wanted to know how on earth you treat somebody with, a, with an accident like that in 1829, and I assumed that, that he must have died. But actually, amazingly, um, he made a full recovery. So I found myself gripped. It was only a very short story. It's only kind of a few hundred words, but I found myself completely gripped by this. And, and what I actually found when, when I read a few more of these journals was that these, these stories are just kind of littered across their pages. You can hardly, you know, open one of these books without finding some incredible story. So, so that was the moment about three years ago I just started collecting these stories just for my own amusement. Well, I mean, it, I, that last one kind of took a lot of cojones, but... <laughs> That was uh, th there's some strange things in there, and I know that, uh, like I, I, I was I've been listening to it uh, the, the last nights. I, I do the audio books, and um, and you're on it. Actually, you you talk on it. Uh, you and uh, and another person. So that's really cool. I like it when an author reads their own stuff. Oh yeah, great. No, that was quite a lot of fun to do. Although you don't get very much time to do it, so it's it's kind of uh, stressful if you're, you know, you find find yourself reading your own words and thinking, did I really write this? I don't remember writing all these long words. What are they? What, how do you pronounce them? I don't even know what they mean. Yeah, yeah. No, I know that happens to me. Um, so, and the one I liked, well, I didn't like, it, but there, there was the one about the guy that had the fork up his behind. Yeah, this is the story I, I actually opened the book with, and um, it's a kind of incredible tale. It was published in um, what is um, believed by some people to be um, the oldest scientific journal of all. It's certainly the one which has had the longest continuous existence. Uh, it's called the um, um, Philosophical Transactions um, of the Royal Society of London, which is a very uh, ancient scientific society. And they published this incredible story. It's quite short, um, by a surgeon from Lowestoft on the east coast of England. Um, and he had this young man come to him um, with what appeared to be a sort of abscess on his rear end. And um, uh, they, they thought at first it was just some sort of infection or something. But then this, this abscess burst. And this amazed surgeon extracted from it a metal fork. And <laughs> a the young man was fork. a fork, yeah. And, and this was coming through, the, through his buttock. It, it, it wasn't through, you know, a, a, a hole that was there already. 
Um, but he, this abscess burst and he pulled out from it this metal fork. And the young man was very reluctant to explain how on earth it had got there in the first place. So they, the, the surgeon was pretty sure that something, you know, of which he was embarrassed had occurred. And then eventually his guardian, um, who I think was a priest at a local village, said to him that if he didn't explain what he'd done and how this had happened, he was going to withhold his allowance. So <laughs> the young man, kind of faced with the prospects of not having any pocket money, um, said, explained that he'd, um, uh, he'd been costive, he'd been constipated, and he decided that if he just stuck a fork up there, maybe that would shift it. Um, and he oh, lost... no. Oh, wow. <laughs> He managed to let go of it, and it had just kind of disappeared up there. But um, I, I like the fact that this story was published in, in the 18th century in, in the world's most prestigious scientific journal. Wow. So, you know, like, um, and there was the other one with the, now this one I, I find really, well, that one I find bizarre, but, you know, if you worked with Kevin, you'd, you, you know. But, hey, you know what? I work in corrections. You'd be amazed at what you'll find inside of people's orifices is oh yeah I don't, you know, all the drugs and but uh, the one about the pins you know that were coming out of the woman's body and hundreds of them yeah well in fact this is one of a, a very large number of, of similar stories i mean um, one of the things you really notice when you look through these old journal articles and every every one of the, the ones i've included are, are before 1900 so this is 19th century and earlier but you really notice that lifestyles have changed so much. And one of the ways in which you notice this is there are a lot of injuries involving pins and needles and all the sorts of tools of the trade of, um, you know, sewing and making clothes and repairing clothes, which, of course, used to happen in pretty much every household everywhere. Unless, you know, you're an aristocrat and you can afford to buy all your clothes People were repairing the whole time. There are lots of cases of people swallowing pins or needles by mistake. But this particular case is really unusual. She was known as, she was a woman known as the Copenhagen needle patient. We, I don't think we actually know her name. Um, but she first went to a doctor with what seemed to be kind of abdominal pains. And it was a real mystery what had caused this. And eventually she started developing these strange little kind of swollen sores at various bits of her body. And um, the doctor who first treated her was uh, astonished when one of these, they looked like sort of little pimples or spots or something, but he noticed there was something metallic in it, and he pulled at this thing, and it was a needle. And um, she must have, I think she was probably suffering from some sort of uh, mental illness. Um, there, there are various conditions which um, who sufferers uh, compulsively swallow things. There's particularly a condition called pica. Um, but she yeah. seems to have swallowed needles compulsively, uh, and they came out all over her body. Um, when needles are swallowed, they can migrate amazing distances through the human body. They can pierce the, um, the lining of the gut and then sort of wander... Um, everywhere. So she was getting needles appearing from her armpits, from her chest, from even her upper thighs. And, and we're not just talking, you know, a few dozen. We're talking hundreds of needles. Good Lord. <laughs> now, now a, a, a few I, I can understand. Um, but, you know, that's that's the miracle of the body as it rejects something. I mean, it can, like you said, push it incredible distances. Yeah, um, actually the same thing was, um, was noticed uh, in the First World War um, when surgeons, it was just the, the, the dawn of, of cardiac surgery and surgery in the chest, um, and surgeons found that they, they, were, they were able to use x-rays to locate a bullet, for instance. If somebody had been shot in the lung or sometimes in one of the blood vessels near the heart, they'd x-ray them and, um, and they'd, they'd be able to locate the bullet. But then when they came to operate on the patient, they find that the bullet had completely disappeared. And at first they're thinking, how the hell, how the hell can this happen? We, we've, we've located this bullet to the heart. Um, and actually, this was the first time they realized that they could actually move in the bloodstream. They could go all over the body. There's one incredible case um, of a surgeon who thought he was going to remove a bullet from the heart chambers. And it was actually eventually removed from the patient's thigh having wandered all the way through the, 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 the blood vessels, um, uh, you know, halfway around his body. Wow. And yeah. so this doesn't hurt the body, like, like, especially like people that are swallowing pins and stuff. Wouldn't that, you know, if you swallowed 400 pins, wouldn't that kind of... Yeah, what if they get stuck? 
Oh yeah, and uh, and I'm sure there are many more patients who died or contracted terrible infections than um, lucky patients like the Copenhagen needle patient who actually got away with it. Um, yeah, I mean there are, there are a thousand ways in which swallowing needles can do terrible things to you, and it could only, it would only have taken one of those needles to pierce a major blood vessel or um, go through to, into a, a major nerve or to obstruct the blood flow through the the heart, anything like that, and it might have killed her instantly. She was just a Astonishingly lucky to get away with, um, and I've got actually the, the number of, I've got the number of needles uh, here in front of me somewhere. Um, it was, here we go, the total was 295 needles in the end. It's a really astonishing number. Oh. <laughs> <Lord>. <laughs> she was a I mean, pin yeah, I, mean, I can I can kind of understand, you know, uh, during a military action back in the 80s, I picked up shrapnel along my left side. And, you know, every once in a great while, you know, like you said, I'll get this like little pimple, then it turns into like a little boil and, and the wife will go digging in it and we'll pull out a little tiny piece of concrete. And, and you're right, though, it, it, it will migrate. You know, even doctors warn you today, you know, uh, you know, you got shot pretty close to this. If you if it moves, we're going to have to go in Uh yeah, it's it's bizarre what the body will do to kind of protect itself from a foreign object. Yeah, it's astonishing, and it's not just um, it's not just sort of artificial objects as well. There's a, another case from, um, in fact, the, the English Civil War. So we're, we're talking the 17th century of a soldier who was shot in the head. And for 40 years afterwards, he was spitting out pieces of his own skull. Um, it's, it's an astonishing tale, partly because of the length of time that he was having to endure this, but also because every time one of these fragments of his skull came away, um, it seems to have interfered with one of the facial nerves. So he, he came to know the symptoms. He, he, he gradually became capable of recognizing when he was about to have one of these pieces of skull fragment come out, um, because he, he noticed that his... Um, his face froze on one side, probably because uh, the, the, the skull um, fracture was impinging on one of his facial nerves. Um, so he, he found that his, his jaw became locked, and then shortly afterwards, um, this, this bit of bone would appear in his mouth. He'd spit it out, and then he'd be back to normal. <laughs> wow. He'd be normal with a piece of his skull missing. You know, one thing I found surprising, um, and it, what, a lot of this was because of the way they treated people medically years ago. It's quite different. And, and one that I remember was, you know, the blowing the smoke up the bum. Yes, um, a treatment which was known, um, it was known as Dutch fumigation, um, which may be a bit of a, a misnomer. Um, so a, a bit of context for this. Um, in the um, 17th and 18th centuries in particular, a lot of people in uh, Europe and Britain, the European continent and Britain, uh, were very concerned with drownings. Um, there were a lot of open waterways in places like London and in particular Amsterdam, uh, which has, of course, that massive canal network in London, there's the Thames. Um, not all that many people could swim, actually. And um, there was a concerted effort to try and improve resuscitation techniques so that people who fell in rivers and canals um, would, would, would drown rather less frequently. And they investigated, um, in a quite an organized way, different methods of um, resuscitating people after they um, inhaled water. And one of the methods they investigated is thought originally to have come from actually Native American medicine. It seems to have crossed the Atlantic at some point in the 16th century. And as I say, it became known as Dutch fumigation because it was... Um, it was uh, doctors from the Netherlands that originally pop that, that popularized it in Europe. And it entailed, um, you can either use um, tobacco as an enema, just um, steeping the tobacco in water. Um, but what they eventually decided to do was to burn the tobacco and then pump the, um, uh, the resulting smoke up the rectum. Um, and there was a sort of rationale behind this, actually. I mean, tobacco is a stimulant. They had worked out that tobacco was a stimulant, and they knew that um, enemas were quite a, an, eff an efficient way of getting drugs into the system. So you can understand um, why they were doing it. But the, the nice detail I like about this fact is that um, in the w same way that today we have 
increasing numbers these days of, of defibrillators, which are, are now in public places, you know, not just in doctors' surgeries, but also public places like libraries and bars and places like that. In the 18th century, um, there were numerous uh, kits put together, which included a bellows and some tobacco and a kind of nozzle. And these would be found in coffee houses and shops and places like that, places that were going to be well populated. So that if somebody was pulled out of a river and they appeared to be unconscious, you could just put your Dutch fumigation kit together and blow smoke up their bottom. <laughs> is, and i got to ask, i got to ask, is that where the term came from, you're blowing smoke up my butt? Uh, yes, and in fact, so th the origin of that phrase um, is quite interesting because uh, not every uh, apparatus designed for doing Dutch fumigation included a bellows. So sometimes you would have to um, physically blow it, kind of like, like a sort of pipe. Um, so you, uh, like a blowpipe, you blow the smoke up the person's bottom. And the, the origin of the phrase is because, you know, you had to have a certain amount of trust in somebody or you might, you know, you might want to be um, visibly doing a favour for somebody. So, so because there was, there was a certain risk of kind of what you might call blowback, that you might get a, a mouthful of... Uh, <laughs> so it was a risk, it was not without its risk, let's put it like that, which, which is the origin of the phrase. Well, 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 you know, one good turn deserves another, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, <laughs> this has been great. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't even know where to go from here. <laughs> uh, but but one thing I, I, I've been excited to, to ask you about, I mean, shifting gears and kind of segueing into something else, uh, even though I'm high-centered on, on the smoke right now. Anyways... Is, is spontaneous human combustion. Now, you, you write rather extensively about this, but I've always wanted to ask an expert, what is it and what do you think causes it? I mean, it's gone back for, for a great length of time. Yes, I mean, um, I defer to kind of actual real experts on this subject, but what... Um, the thing that I think is quite telling about the subject of spontaneous human combustion is that there was a real craze for it. And, um, the peak of interest in the subject was the early 19th century. Um, there is a celebrated case uh, from the 18th century, which was documented um, in a London journal, of an Italian aristocrat, um, a woman, uh, a countess in, in her sort of 70s, um, and her maid had discovered her one morning and um, it seems that uh, her, her torso had been burnt to cinders but her um, extremities were still um, kind of intact um, and interestingly there, there was no sign of combustion really uh, away from her body so, so she seemed to have kind of caught fire but her, the furnishings and even the, the sheets on her bed were untouched by the flames. But the thing that's really interesting is, is that there was this phase of about 40 or 50 years in the first half of the 19th century when the newspapers really went big on this and the public were very interested. And in fact, that, that includes Charles Dickens, who wrote about uh, a case of spontaneous human combustion in his novel Bleak House. Um, and what the, the experts in, in this sort of crime scene investigation today seem to agree probably happened in these cases was that... Um, this was an age when almost all lighting was done by um, flames and there were fires in pretty much every household um, and clothes were very flammable. And there seems to be a particular mechanism of combustion in which the clothes catch fire and uh, the fire is then sustained uh, rather unpleasantly uh, by the individual's body fat, which kind of wicks, it kind of wicks off the body. So, I, I, I mean, as I say, I'm, I'm not an expert myself, but having read a bit about it, it seems that that is the most plausible explanation. I think it's worth saying also that this, um, this 18th century case, which um, inspired Dickens, um, uh, it's pretty clear that what had happened there was um, the, the Italian priest who first investigated this case remarks as a sort of afterthought that um, she was fond of, um, when she couldn't sleep well, she was fond of bathing in camphorated spirits. 
The camphorated spirits is, is al uh, it's an alcoholic solution of camphor, and it's enormously flammable. So if you consider that she had, she had basically just taken a bath in, in you know, something almost as, as flammable as petrol, uh, you know, as gasoline, um, and then she lit a candle and gone to bed with it, you, you can see where there's a possibility of, of, of a large conflagration taking place. Yeah. Now that explains one case, Thomas. But what about all these others? <laughs> oh, uh, I don't. I don't pretend to have looked into all of them and ex examined the scenes. So. <laughs> yeah, there's so many, so many. What? 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 <clears throat> the, the the title of the book is the mystery of the uh, exploding teeth. So, uh, what was that about? Well, this is a case report that was published in a, um, an American journal of the 1850s um, called Dental Cosmos. It was actually the first American journal dedicated to dentistry. Um, and it was submitted by a dentist from Pennsylvania. Um, and the, he had encountered three cases separated by 20 or 30 years, I should say. Um, but the first was a priest from Pennsylvania who one day in 1817 had developed this excruciating toothache. And there's a great description of him running up and down outside his house uh, like an enraged beast, the, de the dentist says. Um, and absolutely nothing would ease his pain. He tried holding his head under a waterfall to see if that would help, and it didn't. Um, and then the next morning, at, at nine in the morning, without any warning, this tooth just sort of explodes. And... Um, at that point, the priest turns to his wife and said, my pain is all gone. Um, and that in itself is kind of not too remarkable. But then there were two other cases, um, in one of which the, uh, it was a young woman who was affected. And she said that her tooth exploded with, with such a, an impact that it knocked her over. Um, and a third one reported being deafened for a considerable time afterwards. Um, so there were probably, there are half a dozen documented cases of this going on in the 19th century and, and one or two from a bit later. Um, it's the mystery of the exploding teeth because nobody's quite sure what caused it. There is one a vaguely plausible explanation. I don't particularly uh, think it, it's, it's plausible myself, but other people have suggested it, which is that the chemicals they're using in tooth fillings in the 19th century um, they used all sorts of things experimentally to see if they'd be good, see if they'd work. And it's just possible that some of these patients had had two different fillings in two different parts of their mouth. Um, and that although they were relatively chemically inert on their own, that when they were there in combination, they might have caused some sort of, uh, some sort of little explosion. Wow. Good um, Lord. Yeah. Uh, you know. And that's why you shouldn't put fluoride in the water. <laughs> So now, now there's one that I can't figure out. Now, a woman that was peeing out of her nose. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's actually, I'm not sure it's actually possible to figure this out because there is no real plausible explanation. But it's, it's a remarkable story. And it was published in, um, uh, well, the, the, the precursor to the New England Journal of Medicine, which is, you know, one of the most distinguished journals in the world these days. Um, uh, for, it's a case in the 1820s. Um, and it was a young woman who suffered from a, um, it, it was obviously a sequel to childbirth. Um, she had suffered from something called a prolapsed uterus, which is um, a relatively common complication. It's well understood today. Um, it can be um, at best inconvenient and at worst life-threatening. But as a result of that, um, it's quite a, a, a common complication, which is that the, the bladder collapses, which may, m means it's um, um, difficult to urinate properly. Um, and in fact, sometimes it can cause the, the, um, the kidney failure because uh, it's impossible for urine to go through the, the system usually, uh, normally. But um, after a few weeks of suffering from this condition, um, urine started to emerge spontaneously from strange parts of her body. We're told that it came from an ear and then both ears. It appeared from her eyes, from her breasts. Um, I mean, it, it carries on in this vein for some time. It's quite a long report, this. But then there's this kind of astonishing um, sequence where the doctor claims to have witnessed this, but he says that there was a sudden noise like a pop, a, a, a pop like a cork being drawn from a champagne bottle. And he said suddenly there was a, a, a spouting of urine from her navel, as if from a fountain. Uh, which is, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sight I quite, I would have quite liked to have seen myself. <laughs> 
Um, well, I mean, well, let's look at this. Maybe she wasn't able to eliminate the urine builds up inside the body tissues, and, you know, those fatty deposits can only take so much. So then it pops and releases what it's been holding all this time. Well, you have a point there. I mean, the only problem with it is that the one place that, that urine accumulates in the human body is, well, it's, it's manufactured in the, in the kidney, uh, in the kidneys, and then it accumulates in the bladder until it's evacuated. Um, it doesn't evacuate, it doesn't accumulate in other places like in navels and in ears and, and so on. But there is actually, strangely, um, just one possible explanation for this, which is that if uh, you go into kidney failure, uh, in very advanced cases of kidney failure, there's a condition um, called uremia, where basically all the waste products that are normally eliminated by the kidneys build up in the blood. And in very serious cases of, uh, of uremia, um, there's a, there's a, a phon phenomenon known as uremic frost, where the urea, which is the waste product, um, builds up on the skin. It kind of passes through the skin and it appears as this kind of crystalline substance on top of the skin. Mm -hmm. And if you sweat, uh, the urea dissolves again. And then you end up with a liquid that, that looks and smells very like urine, but on the surface of the body. So there is just a possibility that she was suffering from this condition. There is even, I'll just explain very quickly, there is even a strange possibility that the urine might have come out of her navel. Because if you're um, a fetus in the womb, you have a, um, a, you have a, a channel called the uricus, which uh, takes urine from the bladder to um, the umbilical cord. And this normally disappears during the, the last trimester of pregnancy. But every, every so often, um, you find a, a, a child actually still has a uricus, and uh, it is possible for urine to kind of seep out at, 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 the, uh, at the navel. So who knows? She might just have been suffering from this very exotic uh, combination of unusual conditions, but personally, I think it's a bit unlikely. Mm -hmm. Well, right along these, these lines, uh, I, I'm sorry, um, what about this disorder that, that has been documented that people who were under extreme duress or extreme stress actually bleed through their pores? Um, I, well, to be honest, I don't, I don't know anything about that. I mean, there is a, there's a very, there's a very interesting uh, medical paper, quite recent paper, which I read a while ago, um, in which a, um, a doctor, obviously for a bit of fun, documented all the different colours that, that, uh, that your skin can turn with different complaints. And it's really quite surprising that there are, ca there are cases on record of black sweat and green sweat and yellow sweat and all sort of colours under the rainbow. <laughs> Wow. What, what about the, um, I was going to say, um, how can you tell the difference between what's real and what's not? Like, was every single one of these stories in that, was there any that you sort of didn't believe? Yes. I mean, there, there, are, various, uh, there are various sorts of, of untruth um, in some of these reports. Um, I mean, one thing you have to say is that scientific journals, medical journals, did not apply the same standards of uh, fact-checking and uh, peer review and all the things that we've come to associate now with scientific research. They didn't exist until quite late in the 19th century. So there are plenty of cases. Uh, I mean, the vast majority of cases that I've documented are, um, were written by doctors who really believed what they were writing, so that there's no intent to mislead. Um, but... Uh, for various reasons, what they were writing was often not accurate. So, for instance, um, until quite late in the, I'd say about 150 years ago, doctors were quite happy to write a report about something they hadn't witnessed at first hand, but which they'd been told, say, by a colleague, or they, they, they might treat a patient, and the patient would tell them what had happened, and they believe the patient's version of events. Now, of course, today we understand that, that what the patient says is not necessarily accurate. They, they might be misleading you deliberately. They might just have misremembered what happened. So there's a, a very notorious case in the 19th century of a woman from um, a, a community outside Dublin in Ireland. And um, she claimed to have been vomiting um, uh, live insects. 
And um, her friends and family said that this was happening, and the doctor wrote the report as if this was what had happened, but he was being misled, it was a fraud. Um, so there, there are plenty of cases like that. There are also a few that got through where the doctor was themselves making up a, um, a fake story. In fact, there's a, one of my favourites comes from, um, it originated in a, in a Chicago newspaper originally, but it was then reported in the medical journals. And it was a, a man uh, in Chicago who claimed that he had taught his infant son to swim underwater for up to 20 minutes at a time. <laughs> And it was reported as the amphibious infant. They, the, the, the people who were taken in by this really believed that he trained his, his... I mean, this is a, a child only a few weeks old, um, but he believed he'd sort of turned it into a fish or something. <laughs> well, it's Aquaman, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much is. I mean, the only problem is that, that I, I could find absolutely no supporting evidence um, that, that this person ever existed, either the father or, or the son. Um, it was all based on one um, Chicago newspaper article. And this was the golden age of the newspaper hoax. People like Mark Twain were writing stories at this time in which they made up, uh, th I mean, Mark Twain notoriously made up a theatre disaster in which he said several hundred people had died. But even the theatre didn't exist, let alone the people. Um, and I think there was a certain category of journalists who just enjoyed writing these stories to entertain the readers and to outdo each other in the sheer outlandishness of what they could get away with. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And, and, and now, a lot of this was done by um, medical treatments that were different, like surgery and stuff. Um, I wonder if in 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 a hundred years, if people are going to write about our medical procedures and laugh at those too, right? I mean, <laughs> what was the most unusual medical procedure that you come across? I think the most unusual, I, I mean, it's almost the, the, the medicines uh, rather than the procedures which, uh, which really leap out these days um, when, when you look back at some of these. Um, there's, a, there's an amazing document which was published the first time in the early 17th century, which is, um, th at the time uh, in London, um, if you went to see a doctor, um, the doctor would prescribe medicines for you. Um, and then you'd go to your apothecary shop to get the medicines made up. And they realized at some point in the early 17th century that um, apothecaries weren't always stocking uh, the ingredients they needed to make up the medicines. So this document was published. It's a, it's a short book. Um, and it, it lays out all the medicines and the substances that apothecaries have to have in stock by law if, if they're trading in the city of London, so that any patient with a prescription from their physician can go in and get the medicine they need. And the list is quite incredible. Um, I mean, they had to keep in stock by law uh, something like seven or eight varieties of animal excrement. They had to keep uh, human sweat. They had to keep all sorts of animals like frogs. And, and it sounds as actually pretty much like a witch's brew, some of the ingredients they were using. Uh, they were using frogs. They were using... Um, lion's paws. They were using. I, I have. Uh, I, I've you yeah, know literally. I, uh, they they used crab claws. They used uh, they they used uh, Egyptian mummy. And by Egyptian mummy, I really do mean you know oh, the people yes. the people buried in bandages. Um, Egyptian mummy was actually a very widely used uh, remedy until the uh, late 18th century, um, and there was a there was a roaring trade in in mummy, uh, which was the expensive stuff was actually imported from Egypt. It had been dug up and, uh, and cut into small chunks and was sold in apothecary shops. Uh, but there was also a cheap imitation product, if you weren't rich enough to afford that. Uh, you could use a, a ham um, and then smoke it. <laughs> it was basically smoked ham, what you, were, <laughs> what, you were, what you were using as a substitute. So it, I think it's those. Then put it in a bellows and... <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I mean, the, also, some, some of the, uh, the treatments they used, the, the procedures were pretty extraordinary. Um, and, you know, you've probably heard of, of bleeding and leeches and all that sort of stuff. Um, and bleeding was used for uh, well over 2,000 years. But um, in the latest, later period of, of bleeding, uh, so if you look at a 17th or 18th century surgical manual, um, they used to bleed all sorts of parts of the body you wouldn't believe, like the eyelids and... Um, uh, you know, the armpit, um, uh, quite often for a headache, you might be bled on the temples. Uh, so it wasn't simply, you know, opening a vein or applying a leech to the injured part. It was, it was all over. I should try that. Really? Yeah. How did it work? It? Yeah. Why, uh, would you, why would you let your eyelids bleed? But what was that for? 
Well, leading was, um, this is actually in a textbook by the, it was the most read um, surgical textbook of, of the entire century. It's by a German called Lorenz Heister. Um, and the essential doctrine was that you were, um, it was based on ancient medicine. The idea was that you were trying to keep the, uh, the basic bodily humours or the bodily fluids in balance. And it was quite common, they thought, for there to be too much blood in the system. So you would bleed the eye because you had some eye condition which they believed to have been caused by an excess of blood in the local area. So the belief was that if you ev evacuated some of the excess, um, then the problem would be neutralised. Well, I mean, heck, uh, we may be onto something. What about bags under the eyes? Why, uh, seriously, I mean, I know it sounds comical, but why not leech those? Would it work the same way with just regular fluid, or does it have to be blood? Uh, well, I don't. <laughs> I certainly don't recommend you you give this a kind of clinical trial on your own yeah. uh, <laughs> on your own initiative. I think there might be some objections to that. Well, yeah. I have a waiver right here. <laughs> No, but I mean, ser seriously, it it's just a collection of fluid. Now, in, in, an, in an associated vein, though, I mean, we still, you know, some things don't change. We still use um, maggots to, you know, to debreed, you know, certain wounds. Yes, um, and there are a few treatments, actually, which uh, have had a, a, a renaissance. I mean, uh, there are actually, seriously, there are a few modern um, applications for bleeding. Um, I mean, they're, they're, quite, um, uh, they're quite specific these days and, and not all that often encountered. But yes, maggots have proved to be a very valuable tool um, for um, yeah, extensive wounds where you, where you need to remove um, the crow's tissue. Um, there are others, I mean, there are, there are remedies like, um, um, I believe honey is attracting a lot of interest these days as a wound dressing, something that was used for a long time in the 16th century. It's recommended by surgeons. Um, and um, yeah, the particularly things like that, you, you know, that a lot of these wound dressings in particular, were hit upon after years of trial and error. Um, and when the antiseptic era came along in the 1860s, a lot of the older remedies were forgotten because finally they had a sort of rational system um, for, for, for eradicating microorganisms. Um, and I think there has been some interest in reviving some of the, these older treatment plans for, for wounds and some of the substances they were using, the herbal substances, just because they turn out um, to have antibiotic properties some of the time. Yeah. So um, now operations, uh, w w were there really different operations back in the 1700s, 1800s that would be pretty terrifying? All of yeah. Them. Well, I mean, the, the, modern, the modern, modern surgical era only began in the 1840s, um, which was the advent of anaesthetics, first um, ether and then chloroform. Um, and before then, there was a fairly limited repertoire of operations that surgeons were willing to attempt. Uh, the main ones were amputations, which were used a lot, particularly in warfare. Um, you know, you had a lot of um, a lot of servicemen uh, injured with cannon fire or um, you know swords and whatever. Um, but there were a few other procedures, like removing bladder stones, which was a particularly painful and unpleasant process. Um, and um, even some slightly more delicate surgery like cataract uh, removal. Um, even as early as the 18th century, surgeons were, there was an operation known as couching for the cataract where they would remove the, the lens from the front of the eye with a tiny incision in the side of the eyeball. Um, and some surgeons were actually very skilled at that operation. Um, but there were rare occasions when surgeons went quite considerably further. Um, there are a couple of amazing stories of patients who swallowed um, things they really weren't meant to swallow. In, in fact, um, like in, the in, it, well, in the 17th century, um, a student, um, he, he became known as the knife-swallowing Prussian. Um, he, he was hung over one morning, and uh, he decided that the thing he needed to do to feel better was to make himself sick. And he chose, for some reason I can't quite understand, um, to make himself sick by dangling a knife uh, down his, through his open mouth uh, and touching the back of his throat with the blade of this knife and inevitably he, he let go of it by mistake and this knife slipped down inside his stomach. Wow. 
<laughs> That's either a big throat or a tiny knife. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a sort of table, not the sort of table knife we have today, but a sort of a thing a bit, bit like a pen knife that you, you would carry on your person in those days to, to cut up food. Um, and he, um, he swallowed it. And um, this is uh, seven. I'm just trying to ch check the date on this one. It's it's early. Um, uh, I think it's the. Here we go. Yes, it's it's the 1630s. This happened. Um, and the local surgeons decided that the, that the way to deal with this um, was actually to operate and cut it out of his stomach. Uh, this is three centuries before anesthesia. Uh, two and a half centuries before before anesthesia, and. Um, they managed to extract this knife from his stomach uh, with him just lying on a table. I think he was probably secured to the table um, hand and foot because, you know, who could resist, uh, uh, who, who could manage to endure that without resisting? Um, but by any standards, that was pretty sophisticated surgery, and he made a complete recovery. Wow. Oh. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> Uh, so what did they do before anesthesia? They did, they had nothing. They just sort of what, nothing. No, they had. Well, in in, in later years, um, they had um, like fairly ether. strong painkillers. Uh, like well, before ether, they had things like opium. Um, so it was possible to uh, knock out your patient. To, n not to make them unconscious necessarily, but at least to, to give them a, a you know a slightly better time. Um, but um, or sometimes they might use um, spirits. They, they might use alcohol. Uh, mm -hmm. But for, but, for, me. for but, <laughs> uh, but for most of the time um, before 1847, uh, there was nothing at all. Um, so you really would just have to endure the pain. Wow, that's, that's crazy. During that's crazy. an amputation. Yeah. Wow. Well, there's, there's, a, there's an incredible description from not long before the era of anaesthetics, actually, probably the 1820s, um, a, uh, an English surgeon um, describes going to amputate the arm of a man who, he got his arm stuck in a threshing machine and it had been ripped off basically at the shoulder. Um, but it was, well, his arm was mangled, but it was still attached, and he realized the only thing to do was, was to amputate. And uh, he asked a colleague to hold a candle for him so that he could, he could saw this poor man's arm off. And the colleague then admitted, despite being a trainee surgeon, he said he fainted at the sight of, the sight of blood, so he, he wouldn't hold the candle. At which point the patient himself said, oh, I'll hold the candle for you. So this patient who's having his arm sawn off holds the candle for the surgeon who's doing it with, with the other arm. Man, that now that is self-control. That that takes some courage, I think, doesn't it? That's yeah, John Wayne. <laughs> wow. So, so I, I I gotta ask, what is probably one of the most comical things that you have run across besides a fork in the buttocks and uh, swallowing a pin knife? Um. Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of. I'm just astonished by the uh, the range of things that young men have managed to do to themselves through just sheer sheer stupidity. Um, I mean, there is there is one there is one um, kind of amazing case um, where a, a surgeon in the 1830s, uh, sorry 1850s, discovered um, an egg cup in the small intestine of a patient he'd been treating. I don't know if you have egg cups in, in the US actually, but this is, you know, it's a, it's a small kind of, you know, china pedestal you put your, your boiled egg on in the, for, when you're having breakfast. But this was discovered uh, in this man's small intestine. And the, the mystery is how the hell it got there, because it was too large to swallow, uh, and it couldn't, it, it's difficult to understand how it could have been inserted the other end and ended up practically in the man's stomach. So that's... Uh, that's that's certainly one of the, one of the more ludicrous cases I've, I've uh, encountered. I guess there's a lot of those uh, cases, and it's always been going on where people have things up their butt and in their stomach that shouldn't be. It, well, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things you quite quickly learn when you look at any of these cases is that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a long list of of embarrassing things that things that people have done. That, I mean, even going right back to the 17th century, there's a case of a monk 
who went to a doctor um, with a perfume bottle stuck up his bottom. And he said, when he, when he was asked how it had got there, he said that he'd had a case of colic, he'd had indigestion, basically, and he thought that this, this, uh, this perfume might in some way ease his pain. But, but, but the <laughs> thing that, How about out of the bottle, then? <laughs> Well, the thing that really amuses me is that you read a case like that and you can show it to somebody who works in an emergency room today and they'll say, nothing's changed. You know, I still see these patients, you know, three or four hundred years later, that people are still doing the same incredibly idiotic things to, to each other and to themselves. Wow. So it's, it's sort of human nature, really, and it, it doesn't really change. It's just the, the, the times and how, and how we deal with it. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think it's also worth saying, I mean, you, you may be thinking I'm, I'm having a good laugh here at, at the doctors, and to some extent I am, but I, I've been quite careful, um, I hope, in choosing cases that, that if I'm laughing at doctors, I'm laughing at them um, because even for the stand, by the standards of their own time, they're doing something that's kind of unusually strange. Um, uh, today's doctors are no more intelligent or imaginative than the doctors of 300 years ago. They're just lucky to be living in an age when scientific knowledge is far progressed. So you do have to be quite cautious, I think, about laughing about uh, the way doctors thought they were treating their patients 300 years ago. And in fact, there's a, there's a very good article uh, written 150 years ago by a distinguished Edinburgh physician, um, and he was writing about ancient Roman medicine. And he said, well, it's, you know, it's, it's very tempting to laugh at these strange, ridiculous treatments that the ancient Romans were using back in 100 AD. But the thing is that who are we to say that 200 years from now, um, people will look back at our, you know, sophisticated Victorian medicine and, and realize that we were doing things just as stupid as the Romans. So I think one always has to have a bit of a historical perspective about this and realize that we're, we're, we're not perfect yet and, and nor is our medicine. No, mm -hmm. and, and we have to laugh anyway. What else can we do, right? It's <laughs> well, so your book is out now, and we have it linked to our website. Um, now, do you have any sort of contact information uh, or website of your own that you want people to know about? Yes, well, I've got a, um, there's another, uh, I mean, I've got a whole collection of, of similar cases on my website and information about my book and, and, and previous book, actually. Um, so my website is uh, thomas-morris.uk, or if you just kind of Google Thomas Morris History of Medicine, you should uh, find me easily enough. Oh, yeah, put in, uh, yeah, Thomas Morris, and I always put in medical because, um, um Another another person comes up, but always <laughs> I can't remember now. But again, it's been great. Um, thank you very much, and um, we hope to have you on again soon. Great. Well, thanks. It's been great talking to you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.